Good morning, party people. And if you listen very closely, you probably can't hear it, but I can hear the sounds of all kinds of running water, like somebody's running like 10 baths at once all around me. Because I'm in a glacier, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name, in Iceland. I'll put the name in the description, in the video description. I'm at a, at a glacier in Iceland, and up near the top, there's, there's a white area up there. That's the top of the glacier. It's gradually coming down, and then it becomes this dark mess down here. And you might not think that that's a glacier, but this is picking up. The glacier's picking up rock all along. It's carving this uh, valley all through here. Now I'm picking up this rock that's below me. Plus, also, whenever volcanoes erupt, they leave a layer of ash on top of the ice. So this one in particular is really dirty. Uh, but the reason why I like coming to it, it's one of the few uh, uh, glaciers that you can just walk right up to. I had like a 15 minute walk from where I parked my little camper van. Easy 15 minute walk. And if you walk over this way about another 10 minutes, you can just put your hand on the glacier. You can walk right up and it's kind of dirty, but don't eat the yellow glacier. So I uh, figured I'd stop in here and do a quick office hours. So the top voted question from right now is from Kenny Blankenship. <laughs> I recognize that reference. That's awesome. Kenny Blankenship says, what is your opinion of the Microsoft Azure Availability Group's deployment experience that walks you through creating clusters, VMs, and availability groups for SQL Server 2022? I haven't used it myself. For me, I, I think that a, a lot of what you want to do with a cluster build tends to be custom and specific. There's usually a lot of things that you have to tweak about the deployment, um, which uh, IP address ranges you want, which, uh, which uh, regions you're putting it in, things like that. Um, so for me, I usually end up having to do so much hand-holding the first time I build it with a client that I say, all right, now let's script the whole thing out. I, I, I'm glad that they're building a wizard to make it easier because I think it's probably useful for small businesses uh, who don't want to use the managed instances. Managed instances are frankly a much better solution uh, for small businesses. I'm not to say that they're cheaper, but they're just easier to use, more reliable than people building their own VMs. Next up, Mrs. Watanabe asks, what is your opinion of using Windows Storage Spaces Direct as a storage host for Azure SQL VM and uh, data and transaction log files? Do you run into performance issues with this? Yes, because you're sharing the same guest network that you're using for regular network traffic. So under times of heavy network access and heavy data and log file access, you can lose access to the SQL Server. You can run into connection timeouts. Backups and check DBs are the most common causes for this. Next up, uh, Sandy asks, where is the cutoff point in SQL Server where a nested loop with a key lookup becomes more expensive than a scan? Or to put it another way, what criterion does SQL Server use to decide that a scan is cheaper? Every now and then you'll Google for answers to that question, and you'll see people say that you can calculate the tipping point with a certain percentage. You cannot. If you Google for Brent Ozar tipping point uh, cost, I've got a post out there where I debunked someone's myth where they said, oh, all you have to do is calculate this percentage. And if it's this, SQL Server does a scan. If it's this, it does key lookups. It is not that easy. Um, I wish I, it was simple enough to boil down. It's clearly not. Microsoft doesn't publish or document this. And a lot of us look at different query costs and wait, go, wait, this still doesn't make any sense. Generally speaking, it's when the cost, the query cost of a plan is less expensive, that query cost is going to get chosen. But you have to remember that the estimated query cost is built on numbers that were computed way back in the 1990s. They've never been updated with the costs of solid state, uh, modern storage that's more, more efficient at random access, uh, shared storage, servers with lots of memory, etc. So it's not really that simple or up to date. 
Uh, and, and I don't mean to say it as, a, as in it's dismissive. I, uh, you're, you're asking a question that's really useful from a performance tuning perspective. Like, why did SQL Server choose this? That's what you're really wanting to know. When SQL Server makes a bad decision, uh, what you believe is a bad decision, you and I believe is a bad decision. Uh, uh, why did SQL Server make that decision? And unfortunately, it's harder for me to get to, uh, to get SQL Server to change its mind without either changing something about the tables or changing something about the query. Next up, Curious DBA says, given server A and server B, what is the best solution in your opinion to archive data from server A to server B? ETL tools, extract, transform, load tools, things like SSIS and Azure Data Factory. Those are designed to move data between different servers. They have repeatable processes. They have frameworks that can help you deal with error handling, with notification, things like SSIS excuse me, SSIS and Azure Data Factory all day long. Uh, Derek SQL DBA says, Hi Brent, we have some dev servers and availability groups with a lot of databases. Who's doing this? Lord, why would people put availability groups on development boxes? If you know, Lord, give me the answer. All I hear is the Lord pouring himself a bath. He says, so we need lots of worker threads and we're paying 16 cores for each server. Lord, why are people paying for Developer Edition? Developer Edition is free. You gave it to us from the mountaintop along with all those commandments. At least I think that's how this worked. Why? It says, is there any way to deal with the worker thread bottleneck for cheaper? Yes. Don't use availability groups on your development boxes. Your development environment should be able to be recreated rapidly from things like source control. Create a database from scratch, use source control to populate, populate it, or if you don't use source control, at least do full daily backups. But you don't need high availability and disaster recovery for your dev environments. Just log ship them if you want to get that fancy. Next up, Mrs. Watanabe says, what is your opinion of using network storage such as Azure NetApp and Silk to bypass Azure Disk throughput limits for Azure SQL VMs? <sighs> I am, I mean, it's a great question. I don't think it's that effective because I think you're still going to hit the networking bottlenecks that hit each VM, that constrain each VM. But I would love to see someone do performance benchmarks to compare across the two. Ideally, not the vendor, because you know what the vendor is going to say. Guess what? Ours is faster. Call now. And then we'll do one more. Uh, Clippy asks, what is your opinion of the Azure VM best practices analyzer part of the SQL agent extension? Is this comparable in quality to SP Blitz? No, but I don't think it has to be. I, I'm glad that Microsoft puts forward any kind of advice, and Amazon's doing the same kinds of things. I'm glad that these cloud vendors are putting forward any kind of official advice saying, hey, here's how you can do it better. I welcome that kind of stuff. I long for the day when we don't need SP Blitz. There are so many things built into SP Blitz that I just shake my head as to why is Microsoft still causing this as a problem. Cost threshold for parallelism. In the year 2023, we should not be setting cost threshold because Microsoft still can't figure out what the default should be. Ooh, I heard a plop down there. So I, I long for the day when the vendors fix those kinds of things. And every couple of months we ship a new version of SP Blitz and we catch more stuff and we alert you about more things. So there's, a, there's this continuous race of us trying to make SP Blitz better versus the vendors trying to improve their products. And surely they've got to win, right? Because I'm just a guy standing in front of a glacier asking it to love him. Is that how that works? I think that's how that works.
It's really neat how the temperature difference hits. Uh, down by where I parked the camper van, it's several degrees warmer than it is here. Uh, and but and I said I've been, I played this game before. I've been to this glacier before, and I've you know come in wearing all kinds of jackets. And then as you get closer to the the glacier, the temperature drops dramatically. It's really funny. It really drops a lot uh, to the point where I'm I'm almost sweating underneath this. Um, but uh, it's really neat to see just you know how how the cold air comes wafting down off of the glacier it's really nice all right well that is it for this episode of office hours i'm going to now set the camera down go pack up and uh, hike back out to the car about a 15 minute hike back out to the car and then uh, i think i'm going to go get dinner i've got to drive like two hours before i can get to a good restaurant iceland has a lot of really good restaurants uh, the, the, like the quality of food presentation is just totally spectacular here. It's always amazes me. Even just like small roadside restaurants put together really good looking plates. Uh, so I'm going to go head out, go get myself another uh, nice dinner, probably some fresh Icelandic fish or maybe some uh, lamb. And I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios. Watch me trip. <laughs>